We just watched the entirety of social media try to do it for a whole year and they were all terrible. Look at me, look at me. Every single one of your fucking Wes Anderson videos sucked. Sweet Christmas. Hello, hello, hello. This is Che. This is Corey. And this is the Next Time On Podcast, a podcast where two lifelong friends discuss all things amazing and all things fed in popular culture. Uh, I, I've got something for you, Corey. Start the podcast. Okay. I'm not sure. going to call it the Take Tornado again because I hate that name, but... That's fair. I've got right. a, I've got a, I had a couple takes floating around as I was vacillating between a few. And the one that I landed on that I feel the most confident about because I've been in a real depressive mood lately is that The Flash's box office bomb is okay. bad for movies. Yes, agreed. I don't think I don't think people really th- realize that. Movie fans at least are like good the end of of superhero movies. Which listen, I I'll be honest. I, even as somebody who has a superhero podcast, if superhero movies disappeared tomorrow, I don't think it would super bother me. They're not. I like, would be very sad. Yeah, Sorry. I I wouldn't be like I'm not I'm not somebody who's I, like, pretty get them away from me. I don't hate them, obviously, and I can love I a lot the, of them. Can I go with an insane analogy right now? Can yeah. you just stay with me? Yeah. Um, much like um, like Tesla's blowing up basically and kind of setting back automated driving. Uh-huh. I feel like the Flash. Just kind of putting out this mediocre film with everything working against it, in a sense, is very much, oh, we put out a product and overall it's going to end up hurting the rest of the industry because we tried to do this thing yeah. in the cheapest and shittiest way possible. Yeah. I, I, also, I also just think that there's like, I talk to the, the, my friends at the, at the movie theater I go to and basically like the only stuff that makes movie makes money for them are these event movies. And Mm -hmm. like the only movie that made any money really last year was Top Gun Maverick, which I don't understand, but whatever. Um, People like planes. People like planes. People used to like superheroes, but once superheroes are gone, I saw, um, I will not name the influencer because I don't really give a shit, but I saw an influencer who is not like a, I, not a movie fan, I don't think really, but they posted some like tier list that I think, I guess is going around social media of all the summer movies that they were like. And the tears were like going to see day one in theaters. We'll see in theaters. Might see eventually. Won't see. Blah blah blah. blah. And there was two movies that this person was like, "I'm gonna go see in theaters." I was talking to my coworker about it. Like, just kind of like, cause I'm like, I go I have a movie pass. So I'm like, I see a lot of bullshit out there. So mm-hmm. I'm like, I see a movie probably once a week because I pay thirty bucks a month and I can go see. Right. Like, I it pretty much pays for itself at a certain point. Um. But he was like, Yeah, like if I want to go out to see a movie with me and my wife mm-hmm. and snacks. It's probably running me about 70 bucks sure. minimum. And I'm yeah. like, and that's a really fair point. Like, that's a lot of money just to throw down to go see, like, just see a movie. I think, I guess I went to go see Asteroid City this weekend with my girlfriend and I spent movie tickets and everything included. We got, like, food and shit there. So that's probably close to 50, 60 bucks right there. Yeah. And I'm like, I- it's like, you have to pick and choose. I mean, we like, we like movies and this is like our, like, hobby, oh. technically. So it's like, it makes sense for us. But I got to imagine a lot of people are like, it's kind of like the whole, um, I was reading, yeah, I was reading this book. I'm reading, um, not the nineties book by, um, like in, by God, fucking Chuck Klosterman. Mm. And a lot of the conversation was about how movies were changed once Blockbuster was a thing because people could, um, people didn't have to worry about seeing the movie in the theater the first time. They can go like the whole thing about it became word of mouth and you go into a place to go pick up the movie and be like, oh, we got to talk about it now. Yeah. But nowadays it's one like that with streaming, but also it feels like unless this movie's like you gotta talk about it in the office, mm-hmm. much much like Game of Thrones was, people don't want to go out of the way to see it. Like I know people want to go see Spider Man No Way Home because everyone's like, oh, all the Spider Mans are in it, but no one really wants to go see the movie with the fucking person who chokes people out. Right. So it's like you know, it's I think, and I think that's what's just kind of it's been like that for a while. But I think if anything now, it has to be more of an event, which is sad. It's very sad, but I think like you're right though with the Flash. Doing this, it makes a it's a fucking dent. Well, yeah, I mean, it is the one thing that that superhero movies used to have for themselves is that they were event movies, and it felt like they were a cultural touchstone, and that is, I would say, pretty clearly fading. Now, that is all to say, I think. Uh, well, I'm saying Spider Verse is on the other thing that came out like 
like about a month ago and that everyone in my office has seen that or everyone has asked me if they if i've seen it yet so yeah but i, I mean even i think even if you're just talking straight up box office numbers besides the super mario brothers movie um yeah i mean so spider-verse is third but it's it's not like an amazing return for a movie like that guardians is is guardians 3 is is second both are over two this is over the year behind yeah over 200 million behind Super Mario Brothers. So we, don't, we, do, we get, can just forget about that movie happening, honestly. I mean, well, I mean, the, I we can forget it. I about it was like the truly movie. Truly a horrendous piece of garbage, but it will give birth to, I think, the next the thing event series of movies, which is that we were going to get this Nintendo Extended Universe. So, I mean, like I said, I just think I think I've been in a quite a, a down mood recently in. Um, in relation to the the future of movies, obviously this is not a new thing. Cinema has been on the decline uh, as like a cultural center point of our of our society for a while. But if if it gets to the point where all the movie theaters start closing, we're we're in like real trouble. Um, so if 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 the Flash can't even get people to get their butts in the seats, I don't I don't know what can. I don't know. I don't think we should have the, the Flash be a barometer of it though. There's like a lot of things. Like even the people at my office were like. Yeah, but they're rebooting everything, right? Like, not people who are even, like, kind it's of true. tangentially it's, know about yeah, it. it is a true. lot of people were just like, why do I want to, like, people like, I don't like Ezra Miller that much, and they're going to, like, reboot the thing next year, right? And I'm like, well, yeah. And they're like, well, I'm not going to fucking go see it then. And I'm like, that makes well, sense. Well, not ne- it's It's 2025. Is well, 20, right? yeah. But I, and I think, in a sense, though, that is a very good thing for them. They should take a year off and then kind of. But I mean, not like people are going to make many new movies next year because the fucking writer strike's still going. So who fucking knows? Yeah. I'm, I will be very interested to see in relation to this take tornado take what these other again i can't I'm, i can't believe i'm going to say this these other two dc movies are going to do this year um because don't forget ladies and gentlemen there are two more dc movies to be released theatrically this year and i'm gonna make the prediction now yeah. blue beetle will be an okay movie that i'll be like i like that but it's and i think aquaman's gonna be dog shit and I'm sure Aquaman's still gonna make a shit ton of money. Yeah, I, I, I would bet. I there is always there is like a contingent when Blue Beetle is, and of course, a very Latino American film. We saw this with, um, I would say, the the film that really started this resurgence in um, uh, Asian American film, Crazy Rich Asians, which I think Crazy Rich Asians is like a pretty average rom com, but got insane numbers because obviously there's this group of people that didn't has never really seen themselves represented on the american film screen uh got a chance to go to theaters i think there is a chance that there is a surprise box office surge for and i hope so i mean like it's a good character i I mean the trailer looks really fun too it'd be awesome if this movie actually was good i'm really rooting for it but i'm with you that i think what will probably happen is it will be an okay movie that does pretty poorly at the box office yeah and we will all as a society learn the wrong lessons as we always do and say like latino americans can't Get people's butts in seats, which is not the case. And the problem is, though, the person who runs that entire corporation is a fucking idiot, too. Uh, yeah, so David something... Zaslov, come on the podcast. Actually, come come to my house so I can be. Yes, <laughs> uh, let me know when he comes out. We can listen. <laughs> should we? Fuck should him. we start the podcast, Corey? We yeah, push? we should start before I just today... start. Before... You got me. You fucking got me fired, bro. I'm not. I'm sorry. Let's. let's we're not. Uh, today. <laughs> we're not talking about David Zaslov. Because that would not be good content. It's just going to be us yelling obscenities into our mics. Today we'll be talking about new comics from Image and Marvel. Uh, the first episode of Secret Invasions, depending on what you listen to this, the second episode might have dropped. Um, but we'll be talking about our thoughts on the show going forward, so on and so forth. And of course, um, speaking of event movies, one of the last directors that I think can really get people's butts and seats, although still this movie is not going to do as well as his obviously smash hit Grand Budapest Hotel, but... Um, the most we, most recent Wes Anderson film, Asteroid City, we'll be closing out a discussion with today. But um, we've already dilly dallied enough. So, um, yes. oh wait, I almost forgot to do our business. Uh, yes. <laughs> follow us at Next Time on Pod. So all your social media platforms, including over on the YouTube, go over there, fucking subscribe to the YouTube. It really helps us out. Um, and of course, you can follow us at Next Time on for all of our archives, writing all of our podcasts, all that good shit. And um, let's jump into it, Corey. Yeah, I'm going to go to you first. I'm going to put him I mean, in. you're allowed to chime. I'm going to say you're allowed to chime in during this as well, since this oh, is also. This is my baby, as you know. Yes, it is. You're allowed to chime in very much. I'm going to put a minute on the clock whenever you're ready. Yeah, man, let's do it. Um, So for my pitch, it's something that we definitely have talked about, Che and I, in the podcast before, especially over the pandemic. 
but it is the British comedy se- um, reality series, I guess that's correct, uh, Taskmaster. So all the episodes are available on YouTube. But the general idea is to get each season, they get a group of five comedians to com- to compete compete in loose terms over a series of tasks that can range from the nonsensical to simple to absolutely confusing and kind of watching the mental degradation of a group of individuals over the course of like six or seven weeks as they get ridiculed by a 6'8 giant. Am I really missing anything, Shay? Can you kind of add on to that? <laughs> I think it's the it's the most interesting way I've heard somebody describe the Taskmaster television show. But it's all true. It's all definitely true. Um, yeah, I, I really obviously, as Corey said, and I talked about this show on the podcast before, I think this is probably one of the best things on TV, if not the best thing on TV. I and... think it actually, it might be the perfect show because you, you can't, you can watch whatever mood you're in. Yeah. You'll always laugh. Like I like watched an episode today at lunch at my desk and I was like, I can't watch this in the office because I was laughing too hard to myself. I also um, think it is, it, it is one of those things that looks effortless, but for the, for anybody oh, who it's... thinks that like all you have to do is put five funny people in a room and, and, and get two people to do silly tasks, just do like Watch the American Taskmaster, which is bad, and for I a lot of reasons, it. don't bother. There's a, there's yeah. a, the the Australian and New Zealand versions of this show. I also really enjoy. There's other versions from other other European countries that I've I think tried. it's a Sweden one. Yeah, there, no, there's there's a there's so many. There's like a Portugal one. Uh, I think there's a, a yeah, there's a Sweden Jesus. one. There's a I hope Alex one, is, Denmark. I hope one. Alex is getting uh, kickbacks. I, for I think that. they're yeah, they're all licensed good. by, by good, uh, good, yeah. good, good, good. But I don't. For, I love the. The English one, obviously the best. The original is the best, in my opinion. The New Zealand and Australian ones, I think, obviously also really work. The foreign ones, I've tried, but I, I, also, I find comedy in it's a hard not one. English difficult. I just don't really... And I mean, it. even even English-based comedy, England-based yeah. comedy, I'm still sometimes I'm like, I don't even know what the fuck you guys are talking about. There's like, every once in a while, I'm like, I don't know this reference that you're doing. Yeah. But at the same point, but like a lot of the times, like, the show also does help a lot, which is just a lot of slapstick, too. Mm. Which it just kind of is like a lot of like a very good way to base it around it. But as you were saying though, you would think, and I didn't realize it. I think until the show's progression does just get so much. As each season's so much better than the last season mm-hmm. in this show, and the way the task um, get more either more elaborate or just very simple with a comedic like undertone of things, yeah. it just becomes better and better and better. There are several. There are several people that I will text Che about being like, "Is this person like?" stupid like obviously but, the, the the way you just texted me about paul chowdhury is it, uh, has been debated for years whether or not he is doing a character and will not break or if he is truly <laughs> a moron because <laughs> those are the two options see man i i would say like at one point i'm like maybe it's a character but as time went on watching the show i'm like no i think he I think he's just kind of stupid. I, I think he's a comedic genius that is a constantly in character. You you should listen to some of his interviews. That he, I think he has this. He has us all wrapped around his finger. Honestly, I think he's he's one of the best. I wish I could commit to um, playing a character like that because unfortunately my actual stuff is just really annoying. So I just have to live with this all the time. <laughs> yeah, and I, I just people. I wonder if you get how if you're so committed to that character, and let's hypothesize that he is playing a character can you yes. go home and then be a normal person no 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 even do it at home no no it's like how batman calls himself batman in his head it's the same concept he's like it's that's just him all the time yeah right, my favorite paul chowdry story before we move on is uh is it was on the next time on podcast or no great couple of the podcasts though paul chowdry it was on the off menu podcast i um, called him an idiot <laughs> Greg Davis, the host of Dan was talking about going to dinner with Paul Chaudry because they are friends in real life. And when the waitress comes over for the test for the water course, she goes, would you like Stiller Sparkling? Paul Chaudry, he was responds is, what do you recommend? Which is obviously <laughs> fucking unhinged. <laughs> but also perfect comedy in, in, in the same way. I will have to say, though, as someone who's, like, friends with a lot of comedians, um, going to dinner with a comedian is oh. honestly hell on earth. Because oh. it's, like, it is honestly hell on earth. Because they got to do bits with everybody. Yeah. And it makes... And this is why I'm no longer friends with comedians. So the brain, all of, my the brain of a comedian is a, is a terrible It's horrible. Place. It's yeah. hor- It's a horrible, horrible place. Yeah, yeah. As the man who works on the comedy. <laughs> well, I think I, it is... I think it is one of the most impressive art forms that we have. Like, I listen to... 
podcast by stand-up comedians and the 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 rapidity with which their brain works i envy i'm like they they'll say they'll have these the responses or connections or callbacks that i'm i couldn't even imagine doing and there's just a way that comedy especially stand-up comedy breaks your brain that makes you unbearable to be around but obviously like an uh, incredible entertainer so yeah i i i i envy it i obviously i love taskmaster um uh, one day i hope we can do our uh our, our ta- a huge taskmaster podcast now that Corey's hey man maybe, maybe we gotta actually maybe that's what we gotta do i mean we have to do two spinoff podcasts we still have to do evil we're oh, gonna do the evils the evil oh, spinoff podcast so it's, and it's our coming taskmaster. back soon right <laughs> Evil, evil Corey, Corey, I didn't know that. I'm so dude. I'm a season behind, bro. I got to fucking catch up. It, um, it just gets weirder. <laughs> I gotta say, Che, I really do think we should go with this idea. Um, but that's besides. That's an off air conversation, Che. Um, what is your pitch meeting? We have a lot. Of, we have a lot of Ooh. shit to cover, Che. <laughs> We're gonna see how much of that I have to chop up. Um, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> all right, a minute on the clock, and I am pitching the. Uh, uh, once again, I'm loath to admit it. The Apple Plus television show Silo. We based could be cool on... with Apple. No. Uh, I work for them. Uh, Come on. Uh, <laughs> I work for them. <laughs> Based on the book series of the same name by Hugh Howey, which um, the concept is in a post-apocalyptic world with society living in a silo under the underground. They don't know why they're there. They don't know how long they've been there because their history has been erased during a civil war. Um, and then a dissent begins to arise among uh, the the questioning public, starring Rebecca Ferguson, uh, Rashida Jones, David Aiello, uh, Tim Robbins, Ian Glenn, so on and so forth. It is a, an excellent sci-fi show with, obviously, as you saw the list, just an incredible series of performances, but it's just a really, really clean idea for a, a show. I really, just a clean sci-fi idea. I think it's the, the pitch of it and the way it um, lends itself to to narratives is, is so great. We are, um, we're entering the penultimate episode, not entering, the penultimate episode just aired, the finale will be airing um, Friday. So I am very interested to see how the first season ends, which the second, it's, I think it's already officially been renewed. Um, I'm, I'm sure, I haven't read the books, I'm sure, as usual, I love the show and there's going to be somebody who's like, it's not faithful to the books, which I don't, I know, I've always said I don't give a shit about, I don't care. Yeah. Um, just don't, I mean, like, I only give a shit when it's, like, horrible. That's my only time I've well, ever, like, it wasn't. Yeah, if, if you're that's, going That's to my make, adaptation. Yeah. That's my adaptation take, is that the, if the art you make is shit, yeah. I'm like, it's a bad adaptation. But Yeah, the reason I don't like the Harry Potter movies yeah. is because they're not good movies. And I think they're good movies. I, I disagree with yeah, you. Well, I disagree with you. That's okay. <laughs> but if if they were good movies, it wouldn't really bother me. The, the exception to the rule, which neither of these two things are good... But it, let's pretend in a world that both the wanted book and the wanted movie were good. The wanted movie would still piss me off because you're like, it's like, why even, why do that? Yeah. Why do that? It's not an adaptation. Okay, listen, and now you prevented us from adapting this book. Back when Che and Corey had worse taste yeah, than I know. our current takes are, we <laughs> were fucking hyped for that fucking movie. And then I saw it and I was just mad. I was like, I was mad as shit. I, the book. Like, but if, that mo- if the book actually happened, I think somebody would be in jail. Uh, speaking of comic books, though. Let's yes. talk about some new comics from Image and Marvel. First up, uh, I talked. We talked about last week my favorite uh, writer artist duo, Ed Brubaker, Sean Phillips. If they are one A, these guys are one B, and that is Jeff Lemire, Andrea Sorrentino, and Dave Stewart. This is a team that's brought us some of our favorite like horror and. Uh, sort of like I don't think like thriller books. Fantasy. I don't think anybody else in comics does horror as well as these two do. No, and I think and that is half because Lemire has a real sense of the ominous, and fifty percent because Andrea Sorrentino and Dave Stewart's art is well, incredibly they did that, ominous. They did that Joker book too. Yes, that was pretty good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, like just before we get into it, obviously recommend Gideon Falls. It's one of our favorite books and last one, like. Probably since we started this podcast. At least the omnibus image. It's, yeah, no, it's so surprising it's not come out yet. We got a fucking Paper Girls and a Saga, one of the first 50 issues I, of Saga. I don't, I don't think it is coming out, okay. I'm being honest. I don't you. think so, too. I think you're the only one. So they keep advertising in the back of these books, though. So maybe one day. 
do that. They have the Gideon Falls. And, uh, and like they, yeah, they keep volumes. on. Well, not the collective. Yeah, I think collected volumes at least. Mm-hmm. Like every time in each of the issues that I got, they were like, for because I also we also so Bone Orchard as we get into it is a new um, collection. Is it a what are those kind of called? Um, anthology. It's a, anthology of books. Wow. Um, each of them are horror books, and what we're talking about today is called Bone Orchard Tenement. Yeah, yeah the first. There's the first been two others. That one. There's been two other series. Check. Can you check out the one with the well? What that? What the one says? Called. Um, That's Mythos, right? Mythos is the one. I with think the so. Way? It's Bone Bone Tree Mythos, which was the own original graphic novel. The story about that we did talk about that, I believe, on the podcast. I um, think so quick, far this one yeah. having not finished, obviously that is. Oh, sorry. It was Bone Orchard Mythos colon the passageway. It's the connection of these books so far is quite confusing. They're very it's obviously just the whole quite thematically connected with. Uh, images returning obviously same creative team i'm not entirely sure yet what they have to do with each other but so far the passageway has been my favorite which is that incredibly creepy book of the guy on the uh, island yes that one's terrifying who's being basically tormented by a naked old lady (laughs) uh this this first issue though i really liked because like like i said it's just it is an a testament to lemire's understanding of why patience and letting these um ideas breathe really works in horror he introduces all these things that are very ominous but doesn't feel the need to explain them we get the small details like um the key the or the keys and there's something about these keys this guy's copying what is that seems weird there's obviously the gambling addiction um and the life insurance uh, plot line we've got the sounds that gary is hearing that's either in his head or he's being gaslit by his seemingly very nice neighbor um <laughs> uh, and then of course whatever um at the close of this book whatever tanya who's the guitarist sees in her clay that she's sculpting uh, and then run that's it's so terrifying she has to run to her drug dealer to, to tell him that she saw something scary oh man if i had a nickel <laughs> you'd have what 15 cents yeah probably yeah actually. <laughs> yeah so I, I, give me their address <laughs> i think there is a real uh what's the word like cohesion between these two like this creative team they've they've worked i would say worked out their kinks but the first thing they ever did i think is still their best thing so gideon falls which i think the first time the these three teamed up is i still think yeah. it's the best work but but that is obviously where they they really honed this um and this i think craft gideon, with, with, with this is other. definitely like the sister series to gideon falls oh yeah, yeah and i think like what gideon falls does really well in a sense it's kind of i do kind of get the same kind of vibe from bone orchard at least mm-hmm. all of the series so far is that what Gideon falls with like a story of like different groups of people who were connected by the same eerie supernatural force. Yeah. And I feel like Bone Orchard so far is a very consistent following of themes of what the Bone Orchard is, I'm assuming, yeah, yeah. Um, throughout these books. And um, cause I also, at the same time, like when I read this, I also went back and finished the other miniseries. Mm-hmm. Um, but I felt like it's like Bone Orchard, like 10,000 Black Feathers or something like that. Yeah. Um, and I feel like that one was such like, this is a short story. I feel like this was like a quick little mini series. And this is the one I feel like they've been building up to at least, or kind of like before. And I feel like this one's going to be like, they're a little bit of like letting this entire idea breathe a bit more. Yeah, I, I will be, I do think that, like you said, we're going to get to a point where all of this stuff really ties together. And this feels like the first time we've had something concrete return, like the apartment building that you see, like you, you, you see in the end of, uh, feathers and, um and, and, yeah there, there is there is obviously this um this figure that sort of resembles some it's, so far it's not a lot in this book but this figure that sort of resembles what we've seen before in uh in the early issues like i said a lot of themes returning nothing entirely concrete yet um but I do I agree with you that I like the the this return that Lemire has to this um these disparate storylines that connected we have yeah. are quote unquote the seven although I'm confused who exactly are the seven um because we get two versions of who that could be and there is this uh obviously intentionally ambiguous collection of characters that is propelling toward something dark and evil um. So actually, like, I real quick, I was looking up. I was trying to find this quote because I was thinking about this, and I was like asking Che beforehand to like, what do you think that ending was from that last one? You were like, I don't fucking know, and I'm like, I don't fucking know either. 
Um, and I think this is the reason why, and I was reading this quote from Stephen King like yesterday, I think. Um, and he was kind of having this big rant about like why horror movies are so difficult. But I think what Lemire kind of does is hit this entire point on the end, on the head. And it's like, um, it's like uh, in a horror story, the victims keep asking why, but there can be no explanation and there shouldn't be. Mm-hmm. The unanswered mystery is what stays with us the longest. And in that, in, in it's what we'll remember in the end. Like kind of an extra part, like nightmares exist outside of logic and there's little fun to be had in explanations. They're antithetical to the poetry of fear. And I think that's what Gideon Falls was to an extent as well. And it seems like what they're kind of doing with this is it's each book has left me with a sense of dread. Yeah. And I don't know what's going to happen to these characters, but I just know for sure it's not going to be a happy ending. I also to to expand on that idea, which I think is a, is a obviously from, from the, the, the King himself, a great, great, observation on horror but although you can't in a in good horror you really can't get answers to mm. to those questions you do no, you I really need your characters can. to be to ask them and it, it it is about this pursuit of an unattainable answer which will then leave you like wanting i just um i mean i'm still thinking about the ending from gideon falls it's been yeah. like what two years yeah yeah, yeah. it's a I'm it's the same thing it. like like uh, the one that sticks in my head to this day is the end of Hereditary, which is like you, it's it doesn't leave you with as many I would say like questions going forward, but you're just like well, the big question is like is, is this horror over? Is the family free? And the answer is probably not. This will continue throughout. Obviously, Hereditary continue throughout generation and generation. I saw now this is obviously not it wasn't intended to be a straight horror movie, but I saw The Blackening earlier this week. Um, and I think uh, that movie is incredibly flawed in a lot of ways. I think it's quite bad. But to the point of this conversation, it does a thing I that I think is so... I was wondering why you did not text me. Well, continue, I never please. thought I'm it was going to be good. I never yeah, thought yeah, it was Yeah, yeah, you know. No, no, please continue. I'm sorry. I mean, didn't mean to cut you no, off. You're, it does this thing that I think it, it really detracts from the, the movie is that it, it answers the question, who is the, ba- who's the big bad? Unlike with like the classic slasher movies that it's riffing on, like Freddy and Jason and Freddy Krueger, those are unattainable evil. And I think th- those even those series, they get bad when they start trying to do this stupid shit like tell us who Jason's mom was. Yeah, and exactly. Like, we didn't like I didn't give a shit. Like I never right. really, I never go in these movies being like, you don't need to you don't need to tell me what the origins of these creatures are. And not only do, not only do I think you don't need to, it will it will ultimately detract from your your fear your, your the, the fear of the unknown is still the thing that the human brain is most absolutely of. yeah absolutely and i mean like that's why i kind of think about that still with um i mean like i thought when the first paranormal activity came out i obviously was like in high school or college or whatever so i thought it was like a lot deeper than i expected but like the first movie did stick with me because you don't have an answer like explanation yeah. you have like a loose idea maybe maybe what happened and, and maybe guess what that series did movies. exactly and then he started explaining the shit and like and I, I think I noticed um, this is such a weird tangent with it, but um, they put they're making a Five Nights at Freddy's movie. I'm not gonna go see that movie, but I was like curious. I'm like, let me watch the. You trailer. don't want to hang out in the theater with a bunch of 14 year olds, dude. My my niece was telling me about the fucking mythos behind like Freddy and the fucking Fazbear. I, I only up. know like tangentially because I, I know that it is crazy, but it's so weird. There's like isn't there? There's like um. Uh, video game theorist has made like 3,000 videos on the theories behind Five Nights at Freddy's. Dude, Isn't dude. it just a game where you sit in one place and check cameras? <laughs> but there's lore, Shay. There's lore. We can't there go. We can't, to be lore? We cannot throw too much shade because we talk about comic books, but at the it's same true. time... It's true. I mean, I cannot, I cannot hate my man's hustle because that dude's definitely making money off of these fucking insane little theory videos. Yeah. But like in that in that trailer though, I'm like, you told me what they were like. Oh, the machines are possessed by dead kids. And I'm like, you shouldn't have told me that in the trailer. Why did you tell me that in the trailer? So now I'm like, is that why canon? am I? A, that's I don't fucking know. But I'm saying like they told me like that's what's that's what's happening in the robots. I'm like, why did you reveal that in the trailer? I that mean, ruins every little. I, I know they were gonna explain right. it anyway, but I'm like, you're also still. I'm like, you're talking shit, but you know you're gonna see it because your boy Matthew Lillard's in it. I'm sorry. Don't don't you know. It was, it was, <laughs> I saw it. Opening night, October 27th, Corey in the theater with his Matthew Lillard shirt on like this. Yay! 
Nah. Hey man, come on, listen. I, I actually I love the Willy way too. I, no, no, not the way I was convinced into watching the first screen movie was because I was told he was in it, and you know what? Yeah, he yeah. was great in it. He, he is, was yeah. a, he, he's great in it. He's great in it. He, I think um, he, I think he has never been bad in anything. No, except for the Scooby Doo movies aren't good. Shut the fuck up. I'm sorry. No. That's a lie. You are literally that is that is a that is the hottest of hot takes I've ever. I don't heard. think that's the. I don't think the Scooby Doo movies are that, good. Is not that. Is not. Oh that no, the movies suck. No, the movies suck. I'm saying he's good though. Oh, I mean, okay, whatever. <laughs> yeah, well, the fuck, fuck you. Okay, never mind. Let's let's just keep moving. Uh, yeah, I I, I just I you know. love this. Um, I love the way this book concludes too, which is that you get this refrain to open the book. Obviously, we're we're. Fully jumping around. But I, you get this refrain to open the book, which is about the seven. The, the opening line of this book, which I love. It's a really tantalizing refrain. Seven. There are seven of them. That much I am almost certain of is just great. It, one, we don't know who the hell is talking. Who are the seven? What, what's You're almost certain of it. Then we get the next page where we see who the seven are, or so we think. And then as the book concludes we get another version of the seven. It's never really addressed that this is a different collection of the seven that includes. So um, the first, the first version to, to go over it is, uh, is Isaac, the young boy, Amanda, his mother, who is, I, I'm going to say a nurse because I don't think she's a, could be a doctor and living in this tenement building. Um, Justin, the drug dealer, Felix, uh, the old black man who makes the keys Tanya, the guitarist, Bob, the uh, gambling addict, and Gary, who is the um, the uh, parking lot attendant who hears strange noises in the night. And then on the uh, near the closing of the book, uh, we get uh, introduced to our narrator, Felix, and then we see a new version of the seven, which is Bob, Justin, Gary, Tanya, Isaac, Amanda, and Felix. So I like that it's I like that it's fluid. Not even our narrator is completely sure of whether or not this is uh, the, who the seven are, what the seven are. Um, Felix is the one who's obviously left out in the second one. And he is the one who's least in the book, except for he has the the what seems like the inciting event of like delivering this key to Isaac um, that will be the, the I, if I imagine a propulsive part of the plot going forward. I, I just, again, it's like you were saying, it's just all of these questions and they feel right now unattainable. And I, yeah. I guarantee you by the end of this book, we will not have the answer to all these questions and all the questions you have in this first issue. There's not going to be a satisfying answer to all of them. And in a way that unknown is what is so unnerving here. And the art's amazing, obviously. Yeah. Sorrentino. And I'm just saying though, each of these things, this is this move, this these books have made me terrified of Wells. I do not. I mean, I'm staying the Were fuck away. Were you not terrified from, of Wells to begin with? Not though? as much. Not as much as I was before this. It's just like the Wells, but I think mm-hmm. obviously, I think the key is open because I guess the entire point about these books, at least the following theme about it, is is basically these different people keep leading lambs to slaughter, mm-hmm. and that seems to be the common vibe of it going forward and i think with each book we're getting a bit a bit more of a hint of it like we've got like the guy gets sent into the first one which is straight straight up just a horror scary naked lady in a fucking lighthouse i mean the it, second it, is, one, it yeah. is quite i mean i love the book it is very much just the lighthouse <laughs> yeah no it's it, it, it's you know it is a lighthouse but hey shall we um keep going shy yeah let's move on we'll talk about um next up we have ultimate invasion brought to you by jonathan hickman uh, this was interesting. I've never, I don't think I've ever seen this before. Penciler, Brian Hitch, inker, Andrew Curry, and colorist, Alex Sinclair. I don't know what's going on there, but we got a three person art team. Um, Some people back, like, I mean, back in the day, it used to be a lot of people used to do like their own, like people, not everyone used to do their own ink. It used yeah. to be a lot more like all over the place, but yeah, you I certainly mean, don't see, I mean, obviously Hitch and, and this, I mean, this team in general is like, I think a pretty, um, classic it's pretty artists. stacked yeah. yeah hitch and i'm pretty famous for the ultimates with miller uh who we just spoke about which i don't think that's a mistake why he was tapped to do this oh yeah, yeah for sure uh the authority and i think i think the currently ongoing the uh batman's grave um andrew curry uh in partnership with hitch also did venom um and avengers and same with sinclair who did um 
Venom, and then it's probably most famous for Batman Hush. So we've got a stacked artistic team, and then, of course, Jonathan Hickman, one of the, the biggest names in comics right now, brings us, I guess, our first, like, really so, big Marvel event book in a, in a while. It's like the big Marvel event book that I actually kind of, like, give a fuck about. Yeah, I guess and that's I true. That, there have been other big event books that, at least for me, have fallen quite flat, and I just didn't read after the first issue. It was like, great, don't care. Which is fucking fair, honestly. Yeah. I think that's, like, very fair. But, like, this is the first time where I was, like, gave a fuck about. So let me let me do the quick nerd um, backstory. Because yeah, I think the villain, just, is, the villain is very important in this book. As yes. all great event books, you need a very good villain. And this is, um, this is a great villain here. All right, so just to kind of speed it through. So... In the early 2000s, Marvel was like, oh, we're not selling comic books. We need a new way to get new readers in. Mm -hmm. That's where they came up with the idea, which was the Ultimate Universe. The Ultimate Universe was like the Ultimates, which was like their little version of the Avengers, where they actually introduced for the first time Black Nick Fury, but it was a very grounded take on the Avengers. Um, There was a couple books came out there. There was an Ultimate Fantastic Four. There was an Ultimate X-Men. I mean, obviously the biggest book out of that series was Ultimate Spider-Man written by Brian Michael Bendis. Mm-hmm. Um, thus leading into us getting Miles Morales from the alternate ultimate universe. But I wonder over if time, they thought at the time that was going to be the biggest hit. I mean, I know Spider-Man is still probably their biggest character, yeah. but I wonder if they took a real punt on that and then ended up getting obviously like real gold out of it. I'm so I'm like, honestly, I think they're probably as surprised as we are with how like much people latched onto that idea. Mm-hmm. But um, I mean, the ultimate universe had a pretty strong run, but when you're building a society, building a universe off of the backs of, Mark Miller, before he went entirely crazy, um, but by the time we got to the third Ultimates, he he fucking went nuts, yeah. and they decided to pretty much start tearing it down, um, for better or is, worse. Is Ultimates um, 3 before or after Civil War? I don't, I think it might be after, but yeah. Ultimates 3 is like the notoriously bad one. Ultimates where 3 is 2008, and Civil War. I believe War. Civil War was 2006. Yeah, that um, sounds right. But, like, yeah, so it was, like, Mark Miller kind of lost his marbles at that point. Um, Fantastic Four was also Mark Miller, which also kind of went crazy. But towards the end of it, it kind of went nuts. The better ideas came from Mr. Hickman before he started getting too crazy, but he took over the Ultimate Avengers book. In that Ultimate Avengers book, he introduced a new character called the Maker, which was this really scary villain, super smart, whole thing. No one really knew what he was doing, but he basically was just fucking wiping the floor with everybody. It was like the, he like was taking over, basically taking over the planet. He got taken out through some like basically bullshit reasons, but honestly he was pretty fucking terrifying. Mm. But during this run, it's revealed that it's Reed Richards or the ultimate Reed Richards who was on the Fantastic Four, but ended up losing his mind and becoming a really terrifying supervillain. Fast forward to Secret Invasion, written again by Jonathan Hickman, Mm. where... All of the Marvel's multiverse, like multiverses, started collapsing in on each other, um, including the Ultimate Universe. And famously, the only two characters who survived from the Ultimate Universe, making it into the regular Marvel Universe, was Miles Morales and the Maker, aka Reed Richards. Mm-hmm. So now we find ourselves: Miles Morales and Reed Richards have been in the universe for a while. Miles is pretty much like he's been acclimated. He's Spider-Man. He's been on the Avengers. He's been on the Champions. He's been around for a while in the Makers. Done a bunch of mischiefs, Venom. But in the beginning of this book, he's been pretty much kept in like to a super lock and key black site government hiding facility because he's insanely dangerous. I mean, Reed Richards is the smartest guy on the planet. So him but evil is not very like it's a pretty terrifying mixture. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's where we find ourselves at Ultimate Invasion. Yeah, I'm I'm as somebody who is not like a big Fantastic Four fan, uh, Probably because I got just got poisoned by the shitty movies from when we were kids before I even read the books. It is still so weird to me that this guy, Reed Richards, who in my head is is like really like goofy, like akin to like Daffy Duck. If and it would be like if there was a Marvel book where Daffy Duck was killing all the Avengers. Um, I will I would read that book by the way. If anybody I would that would be a good one. No 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 yeah no no Talk, call Tom King. I'm sure he'll <laughs> yeah, make that. Yeah, you probably that uh, write, write that well. But, but I, I think like I. I always kind of looked at Reed Richards as kind of like this very like Tom Hanks as yeah. kind of person where like he kind of can be stupid, but in the same time, it's like, hey, I still like you, buddy. So yeah, yeah. the thing, the idea of making Reed Richards like so in this, in the Ultimate Universe, he's a lot younger than our Reed Richards. Well, actually, technically, because of comic book bullshit, he's been in a fucking weird hyperbolic universe bullshit. So he's actually like in his hundreds at this point. <laughs> comic books are, and, Ladies I, say and this, gentlemen, I say this all the time incredibly stupid i gotta put this out there ladies and gentlemen my girlfriend is not fake she's a real woman who decided to date me 
<laughs> no one's ever seen her before, though. So there that is, is that. true. <laughs> I do, I, I, but to my original point is I just, I do think that if I have this connection with Reed Richards that he is kind of goofy and in this book it really works. He is, uh, Hickman does a good job of convincing. I've only, I think I've only read really one book where um, the maker shows up. So I don't have a real connection with this character. And he, Hickman does a good job through this first issue of proving to the reader that he is a force to be reckoned with. Concluding with, I think, just a great uh, exchange where he's talking to uh, regular Reed Richards and says, um, if, uh, if you could do it all again, if you could truly change things, if you had the chance, would you erase me from existence? To which Reed Richards responds, yes. And then he exits with a true banger of, I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> it's, it's, it's excellent. Um, I will. And, and then of course we get to our epilogue, which do you want to talk about the, um, the repercussion what, what this seems like the book is going to be about going forward oh yeah so basically what we kind of the issue is basically about is reed richards like kind of break um evil reed richards the maker breaks himself out of this prison kind of like what the joker does in the beginning of dark knight but in a much kind of more badass way mm-hmm. of doing that um he breaks out he steals a bunch of shit from every member of the illuminati Pretty much tells him to suck it, and as Che said, basically bounces out of the universe. Yeah. What he ends up doing, and it seems to be, is recreating the ultimate un- ultimate universe. Because mm-hmm. early in the issue, he does ask Miles Morales if he wants to come with him. Well, Miles is pretty much like, "No, nah, I'm good. Like, I-, I like it here. Like, my mom's not dead here. This is kind of just a much better universe for me all around." Yeah. Um. But so it seems like he's starting his own ultimate universe again. And what we find ourselves doing is the scene where Spider Man gets bit by the spider but he stops him from getting bit. And I think that kind of does lead into what this, his plan seemed to be for this universe going forward is that in my guess is that he's trying to make a world where without superheroes. Yeah. So is this, obviously this is not a question that you have an answer to because it hasn't been answered, but we'll, we'll probably find out later. Is this, this universe is he, has he traveled back in time no, no, I believe this is a this whole... This is a so different all, universe that he is okay, going to so, make into the ultimate universe. So there's a really, like, in, there's like I mean, interesting. There's a really cool, like, comic book mm-hmm. thing that they did. It's like hard. I don't know if you noticed it, Che, but, like, in the book, the font between the maker's character mm-hmm. is different than the font of, like, regular Marvel characters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's a distinction. The ultimate universe, everyone in that universe used font like that. Mm-hmm. So in the end of the book, where in this whole new... When the, the beginning of this epilogue, Great Artist Steel... Everyone's talking in that universe. Mm. So my assumption is that he's basically restarting the universe. He basically created a new universe based off of what I'm assuming was like his, like the old ultimate universe. Mm. And that's what I kind of figured the book's going to be about. And this is kind of like a way to bring back the ultimate universe um, in a sense, because it really was a fun sandbox of ideas they could have played with. It's just like, I think a lot of editing, like a lot of editorial meddling really kind of just made they had to blow it up mm-hmm. after a while. Like, listen, when you flood New York City and you kill half your heroes, things don't really go back to normal. And I feel like you don't really come back from making Captain America president. I feel like that's just kind of jumping the... Sh- and guess what? It, it fucking rocked. But it's like, you know... But it's like, it was... It's like, at a certain point, you're like, okay, I feel like we ran out of things to do at this point, so we kind of just had to redo it. Um, yeah. So I'm interested to see where this is going. But it seems to me like we're gonna... I mean... Jonathan Hickman, when it comes to high science fiction shit, it always gets weird. And whenever yeah, he that's writes, my one my one fear about, especially when Hickman is dealing with multi universes, is will this get too up its own ass in too? Well, he's already he already did Secret Wars, so I feel like yeah. we can't get much more of its own ass. But I will I, always and I trust. Do think, I do think Secret Wars. I, although I like Secret Wars, I do think Secret Wars gets up its own ass a couple of well, times. Well, I mean, like, we'll definitely speak about some, the plot. Well, I mean, we're definitely going to speak about another artist who does a very similar thing of being up their own ass a bit. But I think mm. Hickman, to me, is a very, like, kind of writer like that, where I, like, mm. no matter what, I'm like, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. But I always will trust Hickman whenever he's writing a Fantastic Four character, because that's how I was introduced to his writing, and he's always been stellar following that. Yeah. Um, and he wrote the best, he wrote the best Ultimate Comics from that line besides Brian Michael Bendis' is Spider-Man. Mm-hmm. So I'm if anybody was going to do this, I would pick either him or Brian Michael Bendis from the mid 2000s. But and neither of those we people can't time travel. So. We cannot time travel in. We don't we we cannot be What confer- if Marvel had given Bendis this book today? <laughs> it would no. Imagine how bad it would be. Do we know if Bendis 
was in, was taken over by a scroll. Can we confirm that? That was actually that. Could I think be... what he is 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 a is a collection of mercenaries all mushed together into a <laughs> into a, a sort of a statue of Bendis that will sit there until it's revealed that he is not Bendis and he'll melt into a different person. I mean, it kind of does make sense. I mean, Bendis likes to talk to himself a lot, so why don't take a bunch of people, smush them together, and have him be this <laughs> weird like "fuck you, I broke out of prison" card? It's a reference for people who have who listen to this podcast and haven't read the comic books. None of those sentences will make any sense, but that's okay. No. That's but no, I recommend Ultimate. I mean, like, I think I, this is a little, great first issue. Is it? This is a great first issue, and I think honestly, without my insane little diatribe that I put out just now about what it was leading into it, you can pretty much. I mean, you didn't really know much about going into this, right? I I mean, I'm I know about the Ultimate Universe, and like I said, I've seen the Maker like once, maybe twice, but I I didn't know like a whole bunch now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think, like, yeah, I think he's only been a couple of things. I really don't know if anyone had an idea of what to do with him. But, like, I'm happy to see if anyone's going to, like, play with this toy. I guess it's the person who made him in the first place. So. Yeah, a, a smart move by Marvel Editorial, which is not something we get to say a whole lot. They, I think they made Yeah, because fucking, yeah, fucking Spider-Man is fucking sanity right now. But, hey, listen, <laughs> that's not uh, that's not for this conversation now. We've already on, we're already really long as it is. No, it's not. Uh, anything else to say about these two comics before we take a quick break and come back? Oh, no, man. No, I think we should keep going. Um, Really do. I've enjoyed a lot. I've enjoyed both of these a lot. I cannot wait to read more of Bone, Orchard, and Ultimate Invasion. Agreed. I did what I did for the good of the realm. The realm. Do you know what the realm is? It's the thousand blades of Aegon's enemies. A story we agree to tell each other over and over till we forget that it's a lie. But what do we have left once we abandon the lie? Chaos. A gaping pit waiting to swallow us all. Chaos isn't a pit. Chaos is a ladder. Many who try to climb it fail. Never get to try again. The fall breaks them. And we're back. So, uh, all right. So we're gonna talk about the first issue of the newest Marvel Disney Plus show, Secret Invasion, created by Kyle Bradstreet, starring Samuel Jackson, Amelia Clark, Ben Mendelsohn, Olivia Coleman, and Kingsley Ben Adir. Um, I, I I say I will say initial thoughts, Corey. If you if you had to say, yeah, good, bad, mediocre. What did good. you think of this first ep- this first episode? I thought it was really good. I um I mean based off of like the trailer I saw half a year ago and the general tone, I really wanted this show to kind of follow along. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm really I'm really really enjoying it. I mean I've always been a big fan of when Marvel does this espionage vibe. I mean this is I love the Winter Soldier a lot. And I think, I mean, obviously I love Samuel L. Jackson and Nick Fury and um, it's just a really fun way to see that whole broken soldier into like a new war situation. You can't trust anybody, which is always one of my favorite spy tropes, but like you literally can't trust anybody because they can like look like you. It's such, it's so much, it's such a fun idea to play around with. And I'm really happy to see this first episode for, you know, this first episode kind of pull that off really well. Yeah. I, th- I think there's a lot working here. Um, Obviously, it's a cheat code putting Ben Ben Mendelsohn and Olivia Coleman in your show. Uh, it is good to see Samuel Jackson back in the MCU. I am wary of it going forward a bit because I don't know if I buy these villains uh, yet. We'll see. I, I I don't have like a ton of opinions on ben, uh, on Kingsley Benadire. Uh, I do think Amelia Clark is like a fine performer. Um, <laughs> Can we just kind of stop right here to say, everybody, if you have not watched the episode, oh, yeah, we're going yeah. to spoil it. So we've only wa- we've only watched the first episode. We're recording the day before the second episode comes out. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, nothing for the second episode, only first episode. I, I think there there is obviously, a, like, I love spy thrillers. There's a lot of really great stuff happening with the spy thriller stuff. The opening of this uh, episode, I loved. Um Again, uh, just are. like a cheat code putting uh, Martin Freeman and uh, Richard Dahmer in your show. Um, what a great, what a great, great um, introduction with um, Richard uh, just kind of playing Charlie Kelly from the episode. It's always sunny in Philadelphia. It just a, a really waste worked. of him though. I'm so, I'm so just a waste of, it was a waste of him. Cause I'm like, as soon as I'm like, I like this guy. I'm like, 
Oh, he's a fucking scroll, isn't he? Oh, fuck, he's gonna, yeah. Well, I knew, I knew either he or Martin Freeman, or maybe both, were scrolls, and were yeah. one or both of them was not gonna make it into the show, and I thought probably I, Martin Freeman was gonna die, and Richard Dormer was, like, famous enough, or not famous enough to make it through, um, make it through the first episode, but obviously Samuel Jackson, legend of the game, is, like, a great lead in the show. I don't know if... Are, are we not a bit sick of, like, old spy last day from retirement stories? I think I'm okay with it mm. for this case. Because, I mean, one, how often do you see Samuel L. Jackson in a TV show? It's true. It's true. Um, and two, I just like Nick Fury a lot. That, like, if you're going to play the old man, like, uh, I'm, like, I'm getting too old for this shit card for anybody. I mean, Nick Fury's always been one of my favorite, like, spy, like, any, like, honestly, comic book characters. I just like, really like a hard-ass as a comic book character, like a spy in this insane world that he's built up. I just, I'm like, okay with it. So like, I can buy it with this one. Cause like, also like he's been gone for so long as a character yeah, that yeah. I kind of was like, I, I like, I do buy the motivation that he kind of is just like a bit like I fucking did all this stuff like that. And even though I like kind of built the Avengers up, I still mm-hmm. like lost. And that has to definitely shake him to his core as somebody who's like very, I have a plan. For I think, everything. I think that is a great character motivation point or like a great great narrative element in his character that i didn't really consider that he is he's been so he was so unstoppable for so like so long that he comes across and they i mean obviously they ultimately defeat thanos and like yeah. other than some people losing five years of their lives and then uh and like chris evans <laughs> leaving they, they sort of like they sort of like they came out kind of unscathed well, I mean, um, you forgot about a whole Iron Man, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah I, mean, I wasn't entirely in escape, but I'm just in the comparison of half of every living being in the entire universe dying That's and true. losing like two guys. three people. Yeah, you know, it's not too bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's not that bad. But and I all do... those people in like in a plane in the middle of this. People just kind of probably just they don't really yeah, talk about that. There are know. people who just probably fell out of like just I don't, fell and died. I don't died. think that is in the Disney playbook is to, is to show us people plummeting to their death. I mean, I what? Keep, I keep sending them my pilots for what I think the Marvel Universe should be and Kevin, you do not get back to me, do you? Also, based on like how we see other people come back from the blip, think of how insane that'd be. You're just on a plane and then yeah. suddenly you're in the air. <laughs> That would suck. Or worst. you're on a boat. You're just in the water. Oh, no, I don't even want to think about it. Oh, um, sorry. Okay. <laughs> they all, Doctor Strange, they brought him back to safe locations. <laughs> Probably. There, I mean, there are moments in this show that I, I, I'm like, again, I'm a little more lukewarm than I think you are, but I did really enjoy this first episode. And I think there are moments in this that really sing. My favorite scene by far is when it's Samuel when Jackson. When got shot and stuff. I mean, listen, I'm glad to see her gone. I will I will say that. But it's not my favorite scene. Right, my favorite no, scene is when Samuel Jackson and, and Olivia Coleman are... When, he, when she captures him, um, and then he... That was, a, uh, that, was a really, that was a really fun scene. Like, yeah, just, and like, they're, just, was, they're just like playing against honestly, each other in this... It's just like, yeah, it's like playing against each other. Awesome. Like, I could believe that these people have known each other for like... Years. And I think that's such a good, like a good like, sign of chemistry. I'm like, I could believe you two have known each other for like 30 yeah. years at this point. It's just so believable with between the two of them. And it's, it is obviously like, you can't say like she's above TV. She just literally just did The Crown and obviously like made her, her name on British TV. But it does feel, at this point in her career, still weird to see Olivia Coleman, one of our most celebrated actors... Alive, Oscar winner, multiple Oscar nominee, um, to be in a Marvel television show, and that is still, although Marvel is in, is clearly in this very weird stage and maybe in its decline. We will see, um, but it is still incredible they can pull names like Olivia Coleman and Ben Mendelsohn to be in in these shows. Quick note on that though, I mean, if this does well as well, I mean, that's two positive notes in the Marvel category for this year, honestly. So. That's yeah. like not, I don't. I don't kind know. Of, what kind the of on this one. Viewer numbers have been because obviously you'll, you'll Disney Plus will never tell us that. They'll, I mean, they don't. Want, they don't want to tell their own fucking writers. So who <laughs> fucking knows? I'm like, yeah. But the reviews have been not not amazing. They've been okay. Oh really? Like, yeah, it's oh. gotten it's getting like a seven out of ten, I think, and generally. I think I would probably give it an eight. I wonder if those are reviewers who have gotten. All like more, three of them, or two. more copies of the season going forward. I, don't, I mean, yeah, because I think this first episode is pretty. 
as far as setup, is like pretty faultless. Um, yeah, I couldn't think of anything. Like honestly, it did hit all the notes correctly. I think it introduced like a lot of characters and their motivations. Mm-hmm. I think it definitely does hinge a lot on what we're gonna see with our bad guy. Yes, yeah, and that, that's I, where my worry is. But I this. do think they have the opportunity, which I think Secret Invasion really does would not work in like a streaming bingeable format is because I imagine each episode is going to be very much cliffhanger. You don't know who's who. And I think that would not, I think that might've been killed if it's like a lot of episodes at once. I've been on the record as saying, I don't think TV in general works in that, in that format, but no, I think Netflix has also been on notice saying the same exact thing. So you're right. I mean, it's still, it still happened. Like, listen, I, I love the bear and then the bear season two dropping all at once is like, Oh, that's I, weird. I didn't know they did that. Well, they, they did, I think they did the same with the first season, but after that's and then it got so much acclaim. I thought they would do episodic next season, but it is it is obviously like a little bit of it's like sweet and sour. It, it's got its pros and cons. Where like I can just watch all of the bear at once and not have to wait eight weeks, but I just don't think that's how TV. It does it doesn't make. And I will say this television. as someone who's. It's like someone who like, like I watch TV, but I'm like, it's hard for me to find time to binge anymore just because like going to the office again and shit like that. It's like now it's in a weird way. It feels so daunting to have like a bunch of episodes just readily available for me, even though I was like, I would love to have watched the second episode of Secret Invasion like right now. I think this waiting period I probably have to do until like later this weekend. I'm like, well, fuck, I want to watch it really badly now, but I can't stay. I'm going to stay up to midnight to watch this. Yeah, I think the three at once and then episodic after that is probably the best system. Um, yeah, but I think this. I think for a first episode though, I think it definitely let me, left me at a point of being like, oh, I definitely want to know more. Um, it definitely was like that. The end of that episode, I'm like, oh, she's gonna turn into a scroll. I'm like, oh, they fucking killed Maria Hill. I'm like, and then like I think the my favorite part is kind of like the credits. It's like a credits joke. It's like special guest star her, and I'm like, oh, she's fucking dead. <laughs> Yeah, which is like the the press tour that they had Colby Smothers go on now just seems weird. <laughs> I, I honestly, I that's a smart move though. If it I was a smart, killer no, character, I, did, if I, I was, thought this was going to be the Maria Hill show, honestly, which I was a little terrified for. But um, you got to give Samuel L. Jackson that motivation, man. You got to give him that spite. He's got to hate the fucking bad okay. guy now. I didn't. I didn't want to do this because I I don't really feel like it's necessary for me to shit on. This You're gonna probably do it. nice lady, but I did. Yeah. We're talking about the show. I have to talk about it. That's fair. Is she's there very nice. any moment incredibly in nice. her performance and their scenes that you believe those two people like each other at all? To me, they always thought of them as coworkers. Yeah, but coworkers that you're like. At the end of the day, one person goes like, "Hey, you guys want to go get drinks?" And then somebody goes, "Oh, I'm I'm actually a little bit tired today." And then everyone goes, "Yeah, I didn't really want to go get drinks anyway. Let's go home." Those kind of coworkers. I mean, I like all my code. Yeah, yeah, okay, whatever. (laughs) I just think that, like, it is obviously, looking back on it now that it's happened, she's clearly the most expendable character. She'll be great for his motivation going forward. I'm not sure we needed to kill off another woman to motivate a guy to do something. I'm not sure we talking about? We never do that ever. Sorry, my mistake. (laughs) Okay, I think we think I had a rant about that like an episode or two. Ago. Yeah, I don't think it, but obviously this character is oh, did, yeah. different than when Kamala was introduced into the Spider-Man book just to be murdered. Maria Hill has been yes. floating around. The it's been a while for a while since the she's beginning, been, basically. Yeah, since the Avengers, I think so. Yeah, she's yeah. been there for a while. I think while. since Iron Man two, right? Two. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, I think she's been around for a while. So I mean, in a in a sense, though, I mean, like if you're gonna kill somebody related to Nick Fury, it's a smart move to kill her. Yeah, I mean. It, and honestly, if you look back at his character, it's kind of the only person that makes any sense to get all of last, the Avengers that he really was connected like, with are gone. I think his other friend was like Cap. I think, I mean, I think yeah. the entirety of like Winter Soldier is like, I have no one to go through except for you, Maria Hill or Black Widow. Yeah. And now all three of them is fucking dead. Right. That's why I think that his relationship with Ben Mendelsohn is a little, obviously we're jumping like in media res with that relationship. But them being like best of friends and him knowing his like his late wife is just a little weird because I mean, it doesn't feel like Nick Fury is fr- that scene where they're like they're it's very touching but that scene where they're like hugging and they like Samuel Jackson has his head to Ben Mendelsohn's forehead. How they're like, aliens, dude. Well, one of them is an alien. <laughs> well, you know, it's just kind of respecting the custom. Oh, I know, but it just felt. It, I'm not. I'm not saying it was bad, but it was like a little jarring because it just is like 
this doesn't feel like a version of this character I've ever seen, which is not a, uh, again, it's not a criticism. I think it is. It, it would be interesting if this show gives us a version of Nick Fury and allows Samuel Jackson to give a performance as Nick Fury that we haven't seen from him before. And I, I got to imagine when you get Lux, I mean, we haven't really seen much of him really since like Avengers yeah. 2. Do you think this is really? the end of, of I, we've said it like a thousand times that this is, is this the end of Jeremy Renner as Hawkeye? Is this the end of? <laughs> that's, well, I think Jeremy, I think Jeremy Renner might be done, but that's not for acting reasons. But I don't, knows? I mean, maybe. I don't know, I don't know how his recovering going. Hopefully he's doing well. I, but, I, yeah, I haven't really checked in. Like, again, I, I'm just glad he didn't lose any of his limbs, but I do think we won't, we probably won't see Hawkeye for quite a while anyway. So probably not though. To recover. I think, um, if anything, I'm really wondering how this, because I mean, this is so much of Captain Marvel's like storyline a bit too. Like she's been so like, I mean, the one movie, I mean, I'm saying her storyline in general, the Marvel universe Mm -hmm. was basically this. Yeah. And if anything right now, Captain Marvel seems kind of like a dickhead because this is the second group of people that she's dipped out on so far. So she's got some serious explaining to do in her movie. I think they did. It's an amazing scene obviously when she comes back in Endgame and single basically single-handedly destroys yeah. Thanos' army but i do think in in doing that they have sort of hamstrung themselves that either like she is in your movies and solves all the problems immediately because she's so incredibly powerful or she's off somewhere helping people and we don't talk about it yeah, but, like, that's true. But I guess, like, I'm interested to see what they're going to do with her character in the movie, too, because I'm, like, like so far we saw, um, I can't remember the actress's name, nor the character, Monica's character, like, Captain, other Captain Marvel, like, how uh, she Monica pretty much, uh, Monica, like, yeah, she didn't visit her dying mother at all, which was kind of, like, okay, that's kind of fucked up, mm-hmm. or, I mean, to our knowledge. Um, and also, apparently, her in, like, she just kind of, like, didn't do shit for the scrolls. So, I mean, that's another big thing, too, so... Tiana so, Paris oh. is the name of the actress, by the way. Yeah. So, I mean, like, but I'm saying, like, we don't know exactly what, um, it seems like something happened, and I guess we're probably gonna get a bit more of a reveal on, like, why they were never able to find a planet, yeah. and, like, what's the lead-up is towards that. But I, I think do it think does, the, yeah. You do have to sort of do that, like, we talk about this a lot, you have to sort of suspend your disbelief that, like, in reality, if there was a cabal of superheroes that could, that could save the world, they would show up to all of these things, like... They'd be they'd be in all of the Marvel movies every time because they'd have to be. That actually was an interesting thing in the Flash movie where like yeah. they all went to Gotham for that point. I'm like, yeah, I guess that would make sense for them right. to all go to a location when shit like that goes down. Right. You you, you right. would. Yeah. No. I, I mean that that does make sense, and and that's why the universe had to die. Yeah. <laughs> I think there is a lot working with this episode. Um, I, I think. There is obviously a lot flawed with it, but if your show is just like great performers on screen, you've got sort of seventy five percent of the way there. And if I if this show is like a mediocre script where I get just get to watch Olivia Coleman and Ben Mendelsohn and Samuel Jackson be just on screen to together, them? that's yeah. fine with me. Good to me, honestly. Yeah. Just just spy thriller falling on people. Who knows who to trust? Sounds yeah. good to me. Um, and I mean, like, it's obviously is too, like, it's also now set, he was already AWOL, and I'm assuming there's going to be some, like, cameras or some bullshit who saw Samuel L. Jacks, I mean, Nick Fury shoot Maria Hill, so I'm like, now his back's against the wall as well, so it's, I'm interested to see what the, um, yeah. how, how he's going to get around this. I, I think obviously that is how it's going to play out. I don't particularly care for that impending storyline i care a little bit no. i just i think that's it's another thing that's been like as same with the old spy the like frame well, it, spy has been it's like i mean yeah been run to death it's like they can't I mean it's like i mean it's not like mission impossible where they just straight up lampshaded us in the last one where he's like he's went off the books three times already i'm like yeah it's kind of silly at this point isn't it like alec baldwin's like why would he betray us it makes no fucking sense and <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it's an excellent point. Why yeah, Mr. Brown's about to get to the point where it's if it's every single movie. If he's all if he fucking turns on him, if he like is off the books again in this next movie, I'm gonna watch I mean, it. But I'm gonna be will. really annoyed. Yeah, he probably will be, will be like, again. I mean it's it's the same thing with Top Gun though, right? It's like <laughs> He's a loose cannon. Yeah, he's a loose cannon who commandeers multiple billion dollar planes yeah, he, from the US government. He should be in jail. <laughs> And like you straight up, you should you should be in jail. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, so um, we will continue to check in on on Secret Invasions, obviously. Who do you think's a scroll? 
who do I think is a Skrull? Yeah, give me a random character that we've seen so far. I think Rhodey is a Skrull. Uh, That's my guess. I mean, he's the only character that we see that isn't Samuel Jackson that isn't a Skrull, right? Who are, what, who are the other supposed humans? I guess Olivia mm-hmm. Coleman. Good point. Oh, that's a good point. Yes, her too. I don't think the show... I think Olivia Coleman being a scroll, at least at this point so far in the show, maybe we will get enough of the character that that reveal makes a little bit more sense. But her being a scroll right now doesn't really make any sense. It'd be um, wild if it was a precedent. I'm like, but it's more of like, we can we really copy the plot from G.I. Joe? <laughs> Rise of Cobra. I mean, if you're asking yourself that question, then you've, then you've strayed down the wrong route, I think. I mean, I think... I, I, think I, I cannot remember... Really, how to do quadratic equations, but I can remember the ending of G.I. Joe Rise of Cobra. A squared plus B squared equals C squared, my guy. Uh, Go fuck yourself. <laughs> I, I do think that because Rhodey is introduced pretty, um, I don't want to use the word ham-fistedly, but I can't think of a better one. I think what is he doing there? Squ- well, he, he, he's there but to I'm saying, remind you that Rhodey yeah. exists. So but I'm saying, what's later his, you what is his job now? I thought he was just like a colonel. Like, it's like the fuck's he doing in the White well, House now? I, the other thing that's funny is like, is he still... War Machine? <laughs> yeah, it's like, like I think he has a movie coming out as War Machine in the future, so <laughs> yes. Yeah. But what is his job now? He's just in the maybe he's a night agent. Maybe that's what he is. <laughs> you think he's the night agent? He's a Netflix uh Netflix is very own night agent. Don't watch that show, ladies and gentlemen. Don't don't watch that show. <laughs> I think I had people who told me they liked it. It that show's written by AI and I refuse to believe otherwise. <laughs> Shout out to Sean Ryan. You are AI. <laughs> you are AI, Sean Ryan. I mean, looking at his list of television shows, which includes SWAT, The Chicago Code, which I don't think is real. There's no fucking way. Last Resort, Timeless, Lie to Me, which I still ride for. It's well, absolute know. garbage, but no, that no, no. show fucks. <laughs> lie, to, lie to Me is awesome. Let's not, let's not, let's not, let's not lump these together. Right. I might rewatch Line of Me. Fuck it. <laughs> it's, it doesn't hold up that much. It doesn't. Actually. Oh, no. It def- I know it doesn't hold up. I don't give a shit. <laughs> Such a uh, fun concept. Anything else to say Tim about Roth. this show, Corey? Now that we're still talking um, about Line of Me, I think probably not. I was about to say we need more Tim Roth, but he was in She Hulk. So now let's go to the break. I forgot he was that. What a stupid last episode. <laughs> I like the last episode. Let's go to break. How's your leg? It hurts a little. And your stomach? Empty as a football. And you love life? I'm not too active. Anything else bothering you? Mm-hmm. Who are you? Reading from top to bottom. Lisa. Carol. Fremont. Is this the Lisa Fremont who never wears the same dress twice? Only because it's expected of her. It's right off the Paris plane. You think it'll sell? And we're back. What's up? All right, we're here to talk about the newest feature length film released from possible white supremacist Wes Anderson. What an insane way to introduce Asteroid City. The most <laughs> recent film I couldn't, was I couldn't, I couldn't resist. I couldn't resist. It is getting to the point where I'm like, no black people, Wes? Well, hey, listen, we got Asian <laughs> No now, black so. people? Oh, no, no. It's not just white people. I would not. Obviously, it's not just white people. I did clock the fact that I'm like, oh, there's an Asian person. In it. <laughs> Two Asian people. Two Asian people. Two Asian people. Black person. And obviously, Tony uh, Rovaliori. Who um just, says, oh, he's just there. <laughs> says about three words of this movie. <laughs> Listen, get your paycheck, homie. But I will say, d- despite the very pale cast of this film, I did like it. I can't I can't fuck with it. I can't I can't fucking I, lie. No, no. I thought it was a I thought it was a very very I, I definitely was I walked out of the theater not really sure what I felt about it. Mm. But as I've gone on, like each day, I'm like, I really did enjoy that film. I think this is a movie, as with, as this will be a very identical conversation to our conversation about uh, French Dispatch from last year, where I think it is not even like 
improved by a second watch. It requires it. I think so too. Anderson, I, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was definitely, I think I caught some things when it was happening the first time through. I'm like, I think that meant to be something else kind of vibe. And I'm like, was that during the play itself? But I, I thought there was several moments where I'm like, I definitely need to go back and watch it again just to maybe ingest it a bit more. But also another scene, like other scenes too, like the Margot Robbie scene at the very end where I'm like, I need to watch that again and kind of just take that in once again. But I mean, he he's doing so much in these movies. Wes Anderson is a, is a filmmaker who is so precise, but also so um, uh, dense. His films are packed to the brim with ideas. And obviously uh, critiques of him that have surfaced over the, the last few years are like he is revisiting the same ideas over and over again. I never really understand that criticism of filmmakers. If you have something that attracts you to storytelling, I say keep going for it. And Wes Anderson has gotten... I think this is a real culmination of a lot of ideas um, that we've seen repeated in, in his films for years. Um, and, and I... I like, like for you, I think a lot of it for me right now is really impenetrable. I don't super understand the sleep scene at the end. Um, um, I'm so I'm still thinking about that one too. I think I think I have a hmm, I don't want to say a theory, but I kind of think I'm. I mean, the entire thing is about existentialism. Yeah, and that's it's, like that's it's about so many. It's about grief. It's about, about grief. lost love. It's about found love. Um, Finding purpose. Yeah, it it is about. Uh, Film. I mean, it is a movie that is about a, or the 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 framework of the film is that it is a documentary television show about a play that became a movie, starring the actors from the play, and you have this sort of like cyclical nested structure of the film that is clearly a comment. At least I believe it's a comment on people talking about how Wes Anderson's films are in themselves very convoluted oh, yeah, no, and, no. And, I, and circular. And he's just like putting a hat on a hat on a hat to prove the point. No, I think that's 100% what um, it felt like a movie. He was like kind of talking about himself mm. in a sense. I definitely did feel that, especially like with the author himself, like mm. like Edward Norton's character. He's like, why did he do this thing? Like, I don't know. He just did it. Like, it, kinda, so... that, it felt like that, too. And I, like also, I mean, like the whole... Um, very on the nail on the head scene about like him when he kisses um Jason Schwartzman's character. It's very much like a character, an artist who's in love with his characters kind yeah. of thing. And it's like a lot of it felt very much like a writer reflecting on himself and, and even and doing the, it intentionally from this like great distance. I mean, these characters are so um, removed from emotion in a way that is I think very intentional. Like I, Wes Anderson has proved over the years that he is capable of real sincerity in, uh, in his films. And this is a film where like, I mean, the love story, love story between Scarlett Johansson's character and Jason Schwartzman is so, it's literally through a window between yeah. two panes of glass and across the, the divide of two houses and his, um, the recurring scene with the, uh, the Steenback family and their mother and the way he talks to his children about the passing of their mother and the fact that he is having sex with a woman within a month of her passing and then his father-in-law, her, who, who admits to not even liking them, seems to have no problem with this. I mean, it is these characters who are so removed from emotion to be art pieces, which is, of course... Yeah. Very much what Westerners has been accused of, of like turning human emotion into art. And I don't think that like nested structure of storytelling is, is unintentional. And, and I think in, a, I, I in think another really sense, here. I think it really works too, because I also think these characters, even though they are very emotionless, they don't really seem to strike out with a necessary goal to do mm -hmm. something. It's not like he's using these characters being like, I'm trying to get this point across. Right. But I think a lot of it too, is, I mean, like as you brought up with that point. And I was thinking about it afterwards and like discussion with like grief and frustration around it mm -hmm. is like, how are we to tell? I mean, obviously from outside looking in, not a good look, but at the same time, how are we to judge somebody who's clearly broken? Yeah. Finding solace in another person who's also clearly broken. And it's like, is it wrong for them to even try to do that since it's so soon? Well, all I mean, these characters, are, right? All of them are so. Yeah. They're all broken. No one knows what. Really? Yeah. Yes. 
and no one knows who they are. No one really knows what it is. I mean, the teacher's clearly repressed from her own emotions, and mm. the scientist, Tilda Swinton's character, who's like just like through her like three or four like were like lines, just kind of talking about how she kind of does feel the need to be around people. Like she wish she had a kid. Like and like kind of hopes to like. I love that foster. line. I think I wish I had a kid is so it's again, it's just like this nested removing yourself from emotion. Yep. She thinks, or it was like, I think I should wish I had a kid. I think that's close to it. Yeah. Yeah. She was like, I, I, I in, perceive that society tells me I should have this connection to these emotions that I don't. And I think a lot of this is, is Wes Anderson telling on himself very intentionally that I don't think Wes Anderson is, I mean, if you've seen any Wes Anderson movies, I don't think this is a, a shocking take. I don't think he is, like, incredibly emotionally adept as, like, dealing with people. And when oh. a lot of that is why his film his films feel so standoffish. Um, and as somebody who in themselves is, like, a complete another monster, uh, I really connect with it. <laughs> so, you know, no, I, I, especially, I... I especially love the Tom Hanks character in this film. It's so strange it's just a strange it's just a strange vibe the entire time and it's just like he's like hitting on everybody and it's just like a weird vibe the entire time but he's like hitting on people but he's like never he's never really pursuing he's just like all right that doesn't work out for me i'm gonna keep my day moving then and he just takes everything to stride but all at the same time with jason schwartzman's character it's just like i didn't like you and he's like i know it's just like it's such a like emotionless but very honest interaction between the two of them where if you were seeing this play in real life, like these people can't act worth shit because they're, they're just, they're delivering every line like without emotion. But yeah. like within this like fake world that he's created inside of another fake world, it just fits so well. Mm-hmm. And speaking to people outside of the fake world, obviously Edward Norton, I thought he was great in a little bit. He did. But Adrian Brody, every time he shows up, I love him I, so much. He's another one who's like always additive. I've never yes. seen Adrian Brody in anything and not loved it. Or I should say, I, I shouldn't say not loved him in it. He has been in some stinkers, don't get me wrong, but he's, he's always the, great. Yeah. I, I still love <laughs> Predators, where he does that crazy accent, is oh is God. just talks. It, it's, it's such a weird movie. I cannot believe that movie exists, but I love him for I being in it. I still ride for Predators. I ride for yeah, man, movie, I'm not saying it's a bad movie. I'm saying it's a strange film, though. Yeah. Um, But, yeah, like, I mean... To me, it was like very much like an artist kind of reflecting on themselves mm-hmm. and at the same time, not entirely sure what exactly what they wanted to say, where he does say some things. But I think it's also a lot of him kind of asking his audience the same questions, basically being like, do I do I need to get something out of this? Is it just more of a self-reflection? Do you really need answers to everything? Because I feel like this movie, which especially as well as like the whole plot around the alien, is that. Yeah. We're not supposed. We're not supposed to understand. We don't get any answers from it. If anything, we're left with more questions. And I well, think that's what it, his intention was in the film. And the people get no film. answers, right? I mean, the end yeah. of the the end of the end of the story with the aliens is just these kids asking a bunch of questions. Did he come and steal our asteroid? Was that our asteroid? Is it, are we safe? Are they coming back? And like the fact that he, I mean, again, visually incredible. I love the way the alien looks. His oh, insane eyes. I like, cannot stop thinking about the scene where he so holds up good. the crater and like poses with it. <laughs> I was like, I was like, that is, that is pure comedy. Yeah. That is just like smart. The framing, the entire, like the, the slow buildup. Mm-hmm. Of course it looks like that. It's fucking Wes Anderson. I don't know what the fuck else I expected it to look like. It's just all of it works. Yeah. And I, and I like, would be, I would be remiss it, yeah. if I didn't, point out that like I think this is visually one of my favorite movies of his. He does this thing where like you're very clearly on a sound stage that really plays in the fact that you're like watching a movie being made in a sense. Um I love the the set that is Asteroid City. I thought the reveal was going to eventually be that this was Las Vegas because we get that scene in the background or that that um the casino coming in the background constantly, uh-huh. obviously in the middle of the desert. Um, Interesting. I didn't, I wasn't even thinking about that. Um, I guess enough, like, I mean, I also really did like the whole, like when they talked about like, we want the sun to always be overbearing. And I noticed that where like the sun itself doesn't ever change when it's a daytime scene. It's mm-hmm. always the same, like not uncomfortable brightness. Cause I mean, I could actually look at it, but it definitely was like, it felt like the desert. Well, I it felt looks, it looks sweltering. It looks, yeah, it looks so horrible. hot and yeah, a terrible place. And the idea it's, it's like never really explained why these people have to go to this des part of the desert to see 
this uh, phenomenon of the three lights. Um, or the, and it's the, also... What is it? The solar ellipses, which I... Again, it's just that... <laughs> Wes Anderson, again, like do, doing a sci-fi movie with like, I would say like clear disdain for sci-fi. The the scene where Tilda Swinton is say, just saying sci-fi jargon bullshit is so funny to me. It's like sci-fi jargon bullshit. Like, what's that? The dots. What do they do? <laughs> I don't know. And it's like, it's just like, it's, it's like, yes, it's like just very like throwback and i just it's like it just kind of like everything it's just fun to see an artist improve upon themselves yeah, yeah. as like their things go on and like i think at times in the same sense that hickman can be up his own ass a little bit i think wes anderson can be up his own ass a bit of course. including this including the scene where like you have you can't um it was like you can't wake up if you don't fall asleep yeah i think that's the whole thing and i'm like the fuck are you doing bro like i, I get what i i want to i yes i found that at the time uh distancing and off and off putting but again i just i the, I the thing the parts of this movie that i have real criticism for i still am like curtailing a bit because i want to revisit it because i know there's just so much more to unpack that i yeah you can't, i can't wait you i cannot, cannot get wait. everything on this first on the first viewing there's no i might try to catch a viewing of it honestly but like when i come back around like maybe one of my days off yeah. because it's and i think i mean like my i guess estimation of what i was thinking about that line as it like went on like I guess it's like kind of the whole thought process of like creative process or just kind of living process is when we just kind of like stop controlling things and kind of just take your hand off the wheel and like, you know, like you can't come to this realization without like, you know, just kind of giving up and falling asleep. Yeah. Isn't that kind of like, you know, people have, people have like equated sleeping to like dying. So maybe mm-hmm. like that's the whole thing. It's just like. Like stop controlling things. It, it, this film is certainly a, an examination of the artistic process in a way that is like, I mean, it is very telling that this main character is a photographer and that he has the, the you know he's he, he's views the world through this the lens of the camera. It, it I mean, it, it, I would not, I'm not stretching too many uh, no. to to say that this is a, a character who's a stand-in for Wes Anderson himself, which makes his relationship with his children. And the Midge character, played by Scarlett Johansson, who we haven't really talked about yet, because because I'm still trying to really contend with her performance, which is so, uh, so flat in a way that feels, I mean, obviously very intentional. We've seen Scarlett Johansson be incredibly charismatic and, and charming on screen, and this character is almost off-putting in the in how removed she is. That scene where I think I think we're supposed to believe that he also believes she's dead. When we get the, the the him opening the curtain, yeah, yeah, yeah. and seeing her, no, I I think he in the kn- bath. I think he knows she's alive. I think they were like running, like, and I took the scene like they were doing scenes still, and like I think yeah. like I it know, seems it, like yeah, yeah. It's like they're taking a quick break. It seemed like I don't think he thought she was dead, which I think that's why he just didn't react to it. I think maybe he was more was like, "Whoa, this is very jarring in a sense," mm-hmm. but it's like I don't think he ever thought she was dead. Well, it's it's I, not entirely different from how he's reacted to the literal death of his wife either. Yeah. Um, but also it's just such um a good note on an artist like Wes Anderson is like when that happened I would be I was just like we were like oh shit he killed her and it wasn't like oh this is like a crazy thing to do but it's just like such like a really it just was like such like it's just like crazy you can be the same shot just doing something differently and it just becomes so much worse in a yeah. sense of like dread real quick but I think I liked her I liked her a lot actually and I think the train oh, yeah. scene yeah I, I really enjoyed it yeah yeah the train scene where she's like like like, I think, like, the one bit of we're actually seeing a lot of emotion from ScarJo in the movie was, like, when she's, like, being convinced to come back around. Mm. And even then, I was kind of pretty much flat. But I did really enjoy her, like, a little back and forth while the guy was reading those monologues. Yeah. yeah. Um, before we get the reveal of the Adrian Brody character, I'm like, oh, this 100% fits Adrian Brody. <laughs> this is, like, this, like, I can, like, now I can hear it in his voice. Um, yeah. As somebody who wrote it out. Um, I'm also, I'm just incredibly interested to see... The, this co- this this film's conversation obviously i want to revisit this but it does feel like because of how precise he he is as a filmmaker and how closely these two films are being made i don't really know how we could like separate this from his film coming out later this same year the wonderful story of henry sugar and i wonder if there is going to be this conversation between these two things which obviously we've said asteroid city feels a lot like Wes Anderson commenting on himself, his criticism, filmmaking, storytelling, all of these things that he's been exploring, grief, all these things that have been exploring throughout his entire career. And I wonder if The Wonderful Story of Henry Sugar, which I think is his first adaptation, he's adapting the Roald Dahl book. I, I could I mean, be wrong. Technic- I mean, technically, Fantastic Mr. Fox. 
Oh yeah, yes, yes, you're right, right, right. I always forget. Uh, I love that movie, but I always forget it's a Wes Anderson movie. It feels, it, it, to me, that feels quite separate from even like I Love it Dogs, does. which is another animated film that feels more Anderson like. Um, yeah, I feel like Fantastic Mr. Fox was a bit more of like I'm gonna do an animated film. They probably were a lot more like you got to make it a little bit in line with a kind of a normal approach yeah, to a yeah. kids movie. Well, Isle of Dogs is like I guess a kid could watch it, but it definitely does feel like a bit more like I don't think a kid would enjoy it. <laughs> No, not really. No, the story. But I think like an interesting kind of note about Asteroid City is like him talking about like not knowing how to end the film entirely too. Because like the movie kind of just does end. It's a yeah. very anti-climax. I mean, like you see like the, everything come to a head, and then the main character walks off stage, literally, and then goes talks to like. I mean, his literally, dead the characters like sense. flee in the middle of the night. I mean, there's like yeah. all of our main characters besides Jason Schwartzman just disappear between scenes. It is. It is again, like just, just leaves you unmoored and, and quite disconcerting. Um, oh, I didn't realize. So apparently the wonderful story of Henry sugar is, is a short film. Um, okay. That's the one I was thinking about. Cause I remember him saying he was doing a short film, which is still going to be like 40 minutes, but still yeah, that's yeah. like, you know, he can do whatever yeah. fuck he wants. He's Wes Anderson. <laughs> yeah. I'm still, I am still just interested that it is like a sort of a two, I guess at 40 minutes, it's not quite a two film year from him, but it's, we don't really see that from directors anymore, especially I don't, he, I where, don't where, think that he could, where does he release that? Just streaming, I guess? It must be. I, I Like, what else can you do with that? Well, I mean, it will be at festivals, and then eventually it will probably, I mean, almost we haven't made, guaranteed we haven't, it will be in the Oscar. Uh, we haven't made our money back from this podcast to go to festivals yet. I think we're, like, almost not in the green at all. We're, oh, listen, I'm, I've, I've already decided I'm going deep in the red to hit up Telluride one of these years. Telluride, see, I don't, I don't really want to go to Cannes. I'm, listen, I'm just too intimidated of French women. I'll say it right now. I don't, I don't know if I can handle with the French Che, girls. we know. But Colorado girls, I could probably, I could probably. I don't, I'm afraid of Colorado, man. Last time I went there, I got fucking air sickness, bro. I don't know if I could go, I don't know if I could ride with Colorado. Listen to me talking shit, I'll probably get killed by a fucking bear in Colorado or some shit like that. I don't know. I I I am. I, um, I I feel like I'm being really fence fence sitting about this movie, but I do think it is a no, movie that you, you cannot dissect or unpack on your first viewing. No, no. I think it's like most of his movies. It's just kind of like a an experience. Mm-hmm. And I I think overall, I definitely enjoyed it more as than French Dispatch because I definitely want to go back and rewatch it. Yeah, I think I, I I think I prefer. It's hard because there are. If all of French Dispatch was, say, the, the uh, last one, Leah Seydoux artistic scene or artistic sequence, or yeah, the the, la- the the last sequence or the the chef one, the chef's one. I just there didn't are, like. I just wasn't a big fan of the Timothy Chalamet bit, and um, the Timothy Chalamet one department. I think is is the weakest, and I also think, I think the, a, and I just like I don't think it's bad, but I think it's just the fact that just kind of like how much I enjoyed the other two parts of it, it just kind of felt like a bit of a drag down, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, yes, I, there, there is, as with the, with Ashford City, I don't think Wes Anderson has ever made a movie I would say is perfect. Even Grand Budapest Hotel, which is my favorite film of his, I think really drags in parts. I, I, it I does. Would not, and like Royal Tenenbaums, the, the movie that like exploded him onto the, the, the scene, really. Is, I had to rewatch that. I saw it as a kid. I never, I realized I never watched it again as an adult because I remember as a kid, I fucking hated it. I, it gets in, I don't think it's one that is like, it's, it's a lot like Isle of Dogs that I don't think Whereas it is, I think yeah, it's still yeah. his his most purely funny movie. It is the one I think it has the most. I think Asteroid City was fucking hilarious. Yeah, like, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I, yeah that, movie, that 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 was so many jokes per minute. It was like a lot back to back to back. The yeah, whole I, I mean, the vending machine bits were just kind of like this is bizarre, but I do like I love you for like having this. The vending machine cocktail is pure funny. It's just yeah. great. Yeah. Just Steve Carell. Just I didn't know he was in the movie honestly. So it was just. I was surprised. I mean, I, I I was surprised to see a number of people in this movie, including uh, didn't know Edward Norton was in it. Yeah, I didn't know Edward Norton was going to be in it. Obviously, didn't know Margot Robbie was going to be in it, and she kind of isn't. <laughs> she's in the yeah, she's movie. not. I, I saw her name in the beginning. I'm like, oh, she's in it, but I'm like, it never. I think. I mean, the the smallest cameo was yeah. Jeff Goldblum as the alien. I mean, per, it was perfect though. It was perfect. It was perfect. It was yeah. literally perfect, and I'm like, it, that makes sense. This is such a strange. I recommend it though. I don't know if you guys. I don't know why you were listening without seeing it. If you just wanted to get like, I feel like it's, the weird thing is you really can't spoil it though. It's just like it's just. I don't think the plot of this movie is all that important, and that I don't. I, don't, I, I think also that's don't the think whole we point of it. Really talked about the plot. No, no, and I don't think that's. I don't think 
that's the whole point of the movie is the plot. I will say the response to this movie is going to be, and I think already it already is quite negative because people who were sucked in by the truly garbage TikTok a Wes Anderson trend will go see this movie and then they will be upset because it is not like cute aesthetic nonsense. This well, here's the thing, like here's, here's here's thing about those times so though. It, it's like kind of like, you know, the Salt of the Earth folks, like mm. simple <laughs> idiots. I listen, I, I a hundred percent agree with you, but I do think they will, they will drag down. I, I, I just, I hadn't looked up until now. So I'm looking at the uh, Rotten Tomatoes, a number that means nothing. The Rotten Tomatoes critic, critical review is 74%. The audience review is 62%, although I did catch when I was looking it up. Audience review on Google is two stars. Two out of you five stars, which is pretty You wild. know what, man? As the time has gone on, maybe Thanos was right. I really love this movie, and I think on enjoyment, I will only love it more if I'm yes. guessing. I could I could be reporting back to you guys in a month and saying that like my second viewing, I actually hate this movie. There's a chance. I would be surprised. It's um, a, it's like It's such a weird thing, too, to me, too. I'm like... Whenever, like, what's this good? And, like, my brain is, like, I liked it, but I don't know why I liked it. And also, oh. I know my own tastes. And my tastes are sometimes just, like, specifically for me. Yeah. And I have to, like, I understand that at this point. But it's, like, I couldn't... On paper, I'm, like, I'm still... I keep on saying I'm still thinking about it. Mm-hmm. And I think even with this review that we're talking about right now, I'm still thinking about it. Yeah. But I think on my letterbox, I put, like, four stars. And I think right now I stick by that. If not, maybe four and a half stars. I don't think it's a perfect film, but I definitely think there was a lot out of it. And it's definitely as someone who's like, I don't want to, I'm like, as someone who's like explored the artistic process in their adult life, it definitely, a lot of it did speak to me between like writer's block and just weirdness and characters and just kind of understanding so many different beats when you create things. And it's just like seeing someone at his level who still like has these thoughts, it's actually really illuminating. And I kind of feel like I took a bit of, a bit more into a peak of who Wes Anderson is as a person. Yeah. Um, to watching this film. Yeah, I agreed. I agreed. And I, and it's like the precision and the attention to detail is undeniable, regardless of whether or not you connect with his, what the themes he's exploring or, or the narrative or like the, the performances he gets, gets out of actors. The, I don't know if there's a filmmaker out there who is more meticulous than Wes Anderson in a way that is really, I don't think there is screen. Um, and I think like, yeah, I don't think you can't like improv these scenes. I don't. And I think that's like kind of like a very good testament to him, though, because I mean, you can't have everybody. Not every movie can look like Wes Anderson, but I think that's what makes his so special. Mm-hmm. And I mean, like it would I don't think there's going to be an invitation to him. I don't think there's ever. I mean, I'm sure there's going to be somebody who can blow me away at some point with their own artistic style. It's no, we just, we just watched we just watched the entirety of social media try to do it for a whole year and they were all terrible. But I loved Wes Anderson. Uh, Wes Anderson's uh, Asteroid City, but Wes Anderson, maybe meet some more black come people. Come on, man. Like, just meet some black people. <laughs> a couple more black people. Just come on. Just like at least, at least three more. Just come on. Just like, I just thought it, would... it, was, it was, it was so funny. There was one other black person in this movie and then he doesn't speak. <laughs> well, yeah. Why well, do you expect the black person to have lines? <laughs> I thought if maybe. Gonna, if you were going to do a person of color yeah. as like a person to add to his films, mm-hmm. While we wrap this episode up, who would you pick? I'm thinking Brian Tyree Henry would be fantastic in one of his films. It's hard because I, I would love to see it, but all of these actors, even even the actors that have been in many Wes Anderson films, they only really deliver these kind of performances in Wes Anderson movies. The only oh, no, actor I'm... who I can picture outside of a Wes Anderson movie acting like they're in a Wes Anderson movie is Tilda Swinton. So like really, you could give me anybody, and I would That's say very like, fair. Del- Denzel Washington. Uh, oh, Den- yeah, no, it's just pretty much. I guess it's anybody who's very has a really good voice and has yeah, had the yeah, yeah. ability to talk. It's like talking fast with a good voice and yeah. making it sound believable, and kind of also acting like a bit of a cartoon character. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think I, I think at this point, Jay, we yes, should uh, let our audience, we should let our captive audience go for sure. Uh, to close out before we we let you guys go, don't forget. We're reading Black Hole by Charles Burns coming later this month, uh, or sorry, later next month because this month is over. Um, <laughs> don't forget to follow us at Next Time on Pod on social media networks, including on YouTube. Go over there and subscribe. If you're on the YouTube, don't forget to like and subscribe. It really helps us out. It really helps hit the algorithm. All that good stuff. Um, anything else for the people, Corey? 
Nothing else from me. Well, I've been Che. I've been Corey. We'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye.